Today we're going to look at a very nice function that in fact generates all of the prime numbers. And well, you might say, well, doesn't the identity function generate all the prime numbers? It just takes all composite numbers to themselves, but then all prime numbers to themselves also. Well, that's most definitely true, but that can't be used as a test. This one can be used as a test. As we'll see, when you input a composite number, you get a certain output. And when you input a prime number, well, you'll get a certain output that will tell you it's prime. But anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's see what we've got here, which I'm adapting from a nice article I found in the two-year college math journal. Okay, so the following function generates all primes. In addition, it produces each odd prime in order and only once. So let's look at the function. We have g of n is n minus 2 times this big object which is inside the floor function. And so what's inside this outer floor function? Well, we've got something else which is in a floor function. In fact, it's n minus 1 factorial plus 1 over n in the floor function. And from that, we're subtracting, well, this thing outside of the floor function. And that's n minus 1 factorial minus n plus 1 over n. And then we're adding 2 to all of that in the end. Okay. So before we see what's really going on here, let's do some examples. So I've like worked out the first couple on their own. It's pretty easy to see that g of one is one and g of two is two. So let's look at g of three. So that's gonna be three minus two, which is one. So we don't need to put that. And then we have the floor of the floor of three minus one factorial, that's two factorial plus one over Let's see, we have a three right here. Okay, so that's looking nice. That's inside of our first floor. And from that, we are subtracting. So three minus one, that's two factorial. Minus three plus one, so that's gonna be minus two. And then this is all over three again. And then we need to add two, add two again. Okay, so let's see if we can do this calculation pretty easily. So 2 factorial plus 1 over 3. So if you look at that, you'll see that that is pretty clearly 3 over 3, or in other words, the number 1. 2 factorial is 2, minus 2 is 0, so this in fact is equal to 0. So we're taking the floor of 1, which is 1, and we're adding 2, so we get the number 3. So at the moment, this looks like the identity function. It takes one to itself, two to itself, and three to itself. But as we'll see, that's not gonna be the case. So let's look at g of four. So that's gonna be the floor of the floor. Here we have a three factorial plus one over a four. And then from that, we're gonna subtract. Let's see, that's gonna be a three factorial minus a three over a four when all is said and done with this calculation. And then to that, we need to add the number two. Okay, so let's quickly do that calculation. So we have three factorial, which is six, plus one is seven, over four, that's seven over four. That's one and three quarters. If we take the floor of that, that's gonna take us downstairs to the number one. Okay. And then from that, we've got 6 minus 3, which is 3 over 4, so that is 3 quarters. So we've got 1 minus 3 quarters, that's a quarter. We take the floor of a quarter and we get 0. So we've got 0 plus 2, so we end up with 2. So let's do one more on the board, and then if you guys want to pause it and do some of these on your own to get a feel for what's going on, I think that's probably something that would be nice to do. So let's do g of five. So that's gonna give us uh, five minus two. Oh, and I almost forgot something here. This term right here should have been a four minus two or a two, but we're multiplying into zero, so it didn't matter. Okay, so anyway, we've got a five minus two, so that's gonna be a three. And then we've got the floor of the floor of, so that's gonna turn into four factorial plus one over five. And then from that, we subtract 
4 factorial minus 4 over 5. And then to that we add 2. So let's do this calculation. So observe that we're going to have 4 factorial plus 1 over 5. 4 factorial is 24. Plus 1 is 25. Over 5 is 5. So this ends up being the number 5. And then similarly, this right here will be the number 4. So we've got 5 minus 4, which is 1. We take the 4 of that, we get 1. We multiply by 3. 3 plus 2 is 5. So there we got a 5. So, so far, we don't really see a pattern, but I'll put in the next couple. G of 6, if you do the calculation, you'll get 2. G of 7, if you do that calculation, you'll get 7. G of 8, if you do that calculation, you'll get the same thing as G of 9 and G of 10, which is 2. And then, well, for what it's worth, G of 11 is 11. So what it looks like is happening here, if you input a composite number, you'll get a composite number. And if you input a prime number, you'll get a prime number. So that's in fact what we'll prove on the next board, but we need a certain classic result to do that. And so let's get that over here first. And that result is Wilson's theorem, which I think I've got a couple of proofs on the channel of Wilson's theorem. It says that n is prime if and only if n minus 1 factorial is congruent to negative 1 mod n. Now we're going to use that uh, in addition to an inequality result to prove the following, which will essentially take us all the way home. And that is the floor of the floor of n minus 1 factorial plus 1 over n minus n minus 1 factorial minus n plus 1 over n is zero if n is composite and one if n is prime. So this function is pretty interesting on its own. It's like a tester function. Gives you zero if not prime and one if prime. Notice not every number is composite or prime. The number one is neither composite nor prime. We won't explicitly say what that does, but we did see it in our calculation and you can redo that if you need to. Okay. So let's get started with how we'll use Wilson's theorem. So let's observe that n is prime. I'm just going to copy this over if and only if we have n minus 1 factorial is congruent to negative 1 modulo n. But then by the definition of congruence modulo n, that's equivalent to saying that n minus 1 factorial plus 1 um, is divisible by n. But that being divisible by n is the same thing as saying that over n is in fact a natural number. So I'll just write it like that. But now if that object is a natural number, when we take the floor, we get itself. So this is equivalent to saying that the floor of n minus 1 factorial plus 1 over n is equal to n minus 1 factorial plus 1 over n. So the floor part essentially just disappears. But now notice that that's equivalent to what? Well, that's equivalent to we can subtract this second object from both sides and see what happens. So we'll have the floor of n minus 1 factorial plus 1 over n minus this n minus 1 factorial minus n plus 1 over n is equal to, so now just offhand we can subtract this second term pretty easily from the right hand side over here. Observe that the only thing that survives will be the n over n, in other words the number 1. So Look at what we've got here. Well, we already have n is prime leads to this being 1 over here. We just take the floor of 1. Okay, so let's look at the case when n is composite. Okay, so we just finished proving that if n is prime, then, well, this stuff inside of the outer floor is in fact equal to 1. So when you take the floor, you get 1. So that's the prime part of our claim. And so next up, what we'll do is suppose that n is composite. 
But observe if n is composite, what we have is the following immediately. And that is n minus one factorial plus one over n inside of the floor function is strictly less than n minus one factorial plus one over n. Well, why is that? Well, recall that we got equality if and only if it was prime. But the floor function always goes in this direction. In other words, I could say n is any natural number or really any integer. Well, integers don't quite work for this, but any natural number and you would have a less than or equal to. But then, like I said, we showed that we get equality by Wilson's theorem if and only if n is prime. So if n is composite, we get strict inequality. But then the next thing that we want to do is get some sort of bound on the left-hand side. And well, that's a little bit trickier. So let's see how that goes. I'll put also here and then we'll look at that argument. So let's observe that n minus one factorial minus n minus one can be rewritten in the following way. And that is as n minus one factorial uh, plus one over n and then minus one and then times n. So, well, that's a pretty easy calculation that I'll leave off. But then what I'll do to that is take this left-hand side and erase these parentheses and change this minus to a plus. And then after that, what I'll do is I'll divide both sides by n. So we end up with something like that. But now what I want to do is observe that if I look at one more than this and take the floor, well, I get something larger. That's equivalent to like taking the ceiling. So in other words, I can put a strict inequality in this direction and then put the floor of this n minus one factorial plus one over n because I just forgot about the minus one. Okay. But then I can take this left-hand side and just boost it up here because I've recreated the left-hand side of this inequality that we started with. So let's just bring that up here. Then we'll erase this line and see where it takes us. So we've got n minus one factorial plus one, uh, sorry, minus n plus one over n. Okay, so there's our compound inequality, which will be nice to work with. Let's erase this line and then go from there. Okay, so from here what we're going to do is subtract this left-hand part from all portions of this compound inequality. That's of course going to give us a zero on the left-hand side. And then in the middle, we'll have this floor of n minus one factorial plus one over n minus all of this stuff n minus one factorial minus n plus one over n. And then what do we have on the right hand side? Well, observe that the right hand side is going to collapse to an n over n. That's a pretty easy calculation. n over n is one. So, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that we've bound this stuff inside of the outer floor between zero and one, but that means when we take the floor, we get zero. So let's just bring all of this down inside of the floor. So just like we have it above, so there we've got that, and that's gotta be equal to zero because it's strictly between zero and one. But notice that's the case when n is composite. We got a zero, but that's exactly what we needed for our claim. Now, let's see how this essentially finishes this problem off. So now we're gonna finish this off by looking at the two cases, but not for this function, but for our you know, function that we've been looking at or we started looking at this g function. So if n is prime, we have g of n is equal to, well, we've got this n minus two, and then recall that this floor by our claim up here was equal to one. So I can just not put anything there. Multiplication by one is assumed, and then we add two, so we get the number n. So if we input a prime, we output the exact same prime. Now, if n is composite, what happens? Well, we have g of n, it's again n minus two times the output of this floor, which by our claim was zero plus two, so we get the number two.
So, well, there's the behavior of our function. We have this function gives us n, or is the identity function on primes, or I guess on primes or the number one. If you recall, it took one to itself, and it takes all composites to two. So yes, this function does produce each odd prime in order and only once, and perhaps it's a little more satisfying than the identity function doing that, but it's not quite as good as a function that would perhaps take in and output the nth prime, which if you look for it, I've made a video on the channel about before, and that's a good place to stop.